a creative genius who had the capacity to make his dreams come true. Walt Disney made his biggest dream a reality in the mid-1950s. He envisioned a magic kingdom for people of all ages that would become, quote, a source of joy and inspiration to all who came to this happy place. Exactly one year and one day after breaking ground on the 160-acre site of Orange Groves in Anaheim, California, Disneyland, Walt Disney's multi-million dollar Magic Kingdom opened to the public with a July 17th inaugural. Since the location of this unique park was of prime importance, Disney retained the Stanford Research Institute in June of 1953 to make an extensive site and location study. Selection of the site was made among many choices, and after a year's study of location analysis, a complete search was done of the land records and where California's population center would eventually be. Construction began in July of 1954. Originally, some trees were marked to be saved and others were going to be bulldozed. The park then began to take shape. In fact, the trees of Adventureland had to be planted months in advance so that the jungle could have a full growing season and wouldn't be so sparse looking. Walt had envisioned a jungle cruise down the rivers of the world. Walt had many camera towers constructed to capture, in stop motion, the construction of the park. The original press kit from 1955 said, Turning back the clock 50 years when you enter the main street of Disneyland, coming through the railroad station from which all Disney traffic stems, the town square gets first attention. To the right of town square is the Opera House, which during the time of Disneyland's construction served as the lumber mill for creating the ornate woodwork found throughout the park. In this 1954 photo, local newspaper staffs were permitted to tour the construction site of an unfinished Main Street, USA. With only 366 days to complete the park and prepare for the opening, construction proceeded at a frantic pace. Since Main Street, USA was patterned after Walt Disney's memories of an idyllic boyhood in Marceline, Missouri, nothing was left to chance. Walt's personal touch was added not only to Main Street, but to every area of the park. Statistically speaking, three and a half million board feet of lumber went into the park's construction. Some 800 workmen were employed daily. That figure ran up to 2,500 employees, working 10-hour shifts as the opening date neared. More than three million cubic feet of paving covered the former orange groves of Disneyland and its parking lot and approximately 32,000 sacks of cement were utilized in their construction. Looking up Main Street, Walt envisioned the Emporium, with his guests making purchases there or completing transactions at the bank. With Main Street itself a replica of a typical small town, Walt wanted to preserve the atmosphere of the turn of the century that would delight and entertain generations to come. From the late 1800s arcade, where guests could be entertained by the diversions of a bygone era, to the streetcar rides up and down the tree-lined boulevard, Main Street was a beautifully crafted and constructed view of an earlier America. Three cities were searched to supply the 100-year-old gas lamps that would line Main Street. Because Walt didn't want his guests to get lost or confused, at the end of Main Street is the plaza, Disneyland's hub from which all of the lands could be entered. Partially patterned after the new Schwanstein Castle in the Bavarian Alps, Disneyland's castle was at one time called Snow White's Castle, then Fantasy Castle, and eventually Sleeping Beauty Castle, to promote the animated film Sleeping Beauty, which would not be released until 1959. 
Since Fantasyland would be the land closest to Walt's heart, in that it would be home to all of his famous cartoon characters, it was necessary to have an icon just past the hub which represented fantasy. Rather than having it intimidating and fortress-like, it was constructed on a smaller scale to make it child-friendly, with its pastel colors and whimsical towers, minarets, and battlements. The drawbridge is actually functional and was lowered to welcome children on opening day, and then again only one other time, when the new Fantasyland opened in 1983. A moat circles the front, and using the movie technique of forced perspective, the stones at the bottom of the castle are slightly larger than the next level up. As everything gets increasingly smaller as the eye travels upward, the castle tricks the eye into believing it is actually taller than its mere 77 feet. Walt loved the idea of having a steamship at Disneyland so much that he mortgaged his own home to finance the construction of the Mark Twain. The hull of the ship was constructed at the Todd Shipyard in Long Beach, California, while the upper decks were constructed at the Disney Studios in Burbank. No steamboats had been built in America since 1905, so Walt's request to construct an exactly authentic steamship, down to the cock and rope seals between the planks of the decks, was a little unconventional in 1955. Although built in 5-8 scale, Walt wanted the Mark Twain to be precise in its execution. It was to be 105 feet long, 28 feet high, and it would end up weighing 150 tons. When the upper decks were brought down from the studio and the hull was brought up from Long Beach, the entire craft was constructed like a huge jigsaw puzzle in Fowler's Harbor after being lifted over the berm surrounding the park. The gorgeous railings and filigreed woodwork were crafted in the mill inside the opera house.
Admiral Joe Fowler, who oversaw the entire construction of Disneyland, was in charge of the specifics of the building of the Mark Twain. He was even given the honor of having the mooring area for his ship, named after him. The Mark Twain was constructed according to strict historical specifications, using the highest quality materials. Because it was constructed in 5-8 scale, its engines had to be specifically built by qualified people with previous experience in steamboat construction. A special design was also called for in fitting the scaled down boiler into the hold. The wheels, spokes and bracing of the paddle wheel were made of oak. The paddles were made of the finest Douglas fir. The actual boilers and engine are run at the back of the ship on the first deck by an engineer. The ship draws in approximately three feet of water as it travels its one and a half miles down the clay and cement lined rivers of America. The maximum capacity of 350 guests was established on opening day when the Mark Twain nearly capsized due to guests running from one side of the ship to the other to see the few animals and sights strewn around the river banks as they were pointed out. First to the right, then to the left. Actress Irene Dunn christened the ship with Art Linkletter with a bottle filled with the waters from all of the major rivers in America. During the live broadcast she accidentally remarked, we're listing as the ship dangerously tipped to one side. From that day forward, to prevent an accident, the no more than 350 guests rule still stands.
before Disneyland opened. On July 13, 1955, 300 guests were invited to the park to celebrate Walt and Lillian's wedding anniversary. They were to take a stagecoach ride up Main Street, take a cruise around the river on the mark, and then see the very first performance of the Golden Horseshoe Review in Frontierland. Admiral Joe Fowler arrived early to inspect the Mark Twain to make sure she was seaworthy. A frantically sweeping lady handed him a broom as he boarded and shouted, this ship is just filthy. Let's get busy and sweep it up. The ex-admiral, who had been so used to giving orders, now had Mrs. Walt Disney as his new boss for the evening. For the annual Dixieland at Disneyland event, top name entertainers such as Louis Armstrong, Harry James, and Duke Ellington performed aboard the Mark Twain for... Monorail was designed by Imagineer Bob Gurr, who was always, and still is, a man on the move. He designed a sleek train with a rocket ship nose, stainless steel side panels, and the famous bubble top up front. For nearly 40 years, Gurr developed more than 100 designs for attractions. These ranged from the mine trains to the bobsleds, from the main street vehicles to the Omnimover ride system for the haunted mansion and adventure through inner space and the amazing people mover. In this 1958 footage, the concrete for the monorail beams was being poured into steel frames at what is now the Circle D Ranch, the pony farm at the back of the park. The method for pouring the cement was controversial at the time, but it considerably shortened the time to build the monorail beamway. The Alweg engineers wanted to build custom forms for every beam, as was their prior practice in their factory which is where Walt, by chance, happened upon a working monorail while traveling through Germany just outside the Alweg plant. John Wise, Disneyland's chief engineer for the project, came up with a series of flexible molds seen here that were adjustable in 24-inch segments so as to provide curvature and twist to each custom-made beam. The metal mold segments were lined with rubber sheeting to create a smoother contour. To this day, one can still see the 24-inch mold marks on the beams. The monorail was designed to carry an average of 340,000 passengers a year. Each train would be powered by a 100-horsepower motor running at 35 miles an hour.
The entire 1959 Tomorrowland remodel was a race against time, in that the submarine voyage, seen here from above, was to open on June 6th. The revamped Autopia, the monorail, and over in Fantasyland, the Matterhorn and motorboat crews were all scheduled to open less than a week later, on June 14th. All of this construction, remembers Bob Gurr, occurred simultaneously. Many of these construction photos and some of the footage were taken from high atop the Matterhorn. The Disneyland Alweg monorail system was inaugurated on June 14, 1959, with a ribbon-cutting ceremony done by then Vice President Richard Nixon and his family. By early June 1959, there were two Mark I monorail trains running through Tomorrowland and serving Disneyland guests, one red and one blue. The undercarriage straddled the two and a half mile concrete beamway, unlike earlier suspended monorail cars, and was guided with rubber tired driving and brake wheels. In June of 1961, the monorail became more than a mere ride when it was linked to the Disneyland Hotel. Guests could board the monorail at the hotel and enter Disneyland via Tomorrowland. Guests could also leave the park to stop in at the hotel's gourmet restaurant or the monorail lounge for a drink. Besides the extension of the track, the monorail became the first in the world to be a daily operating transportation system and the first to cross over a public street. The trains grew during the 1961 expansion from three cars to four. By the mid-1960s, a fleet of Mark II trains came into being with the addition of monorail yellow. The Mark III's were introduced in 1968 for the first new Tomorrowland. The Mark IV's were built exclusively for Walt Disney World in 1971, and both resorts added Mark V's in 1987 and Mark VI's in 1998. The latest incarnation of the monorail, the Mark VII, arrived at Disneyland in December 2007 and will be operating in 2008. In Disneyland's very own little village of Rainbow Ridge in Frontierland, one could board the stagecoach, the Conestoga wagons, the buckboards, the pack mules, and the Rainbow Caverns mine train, all by the first year of operation in 1956. The area was closed in the winter of 1958 for a major seven-acre expansion. It reopened after a year and a half of redevelopment in June of 1960. The original Rainbow Caverns mine train of 1956 had Walt overseeing the entire creative process, from design to construction to completion of the attraction. His creative team of Imagineers included Roger Brogy, Waithel Rogers, Bob Maddy, Sam McKim and Claude Coates, who, by the way, was told it was, quote, impossible to create separate waterfalls which would maintain distinct colors. He was told that by the end of the first week, the colored waters would all merge into a murky gray pool. He took his problem to Walt, who told him, well, it's kind of fun to do the impossible. By the time the attraction was up and running, the waterfalls each had their own individual and distinct colors they never did turn gray.
The tunnel being constructed here still exists in Disneyland today. It is the last tunnel you emerge from before a stop at the Toontown Railroad Station. The mining town of Rainbow Ridge was eventually restored, and the Rainbow Caverns mine train was supplemented beyond the wagon loading area, which provided visual separation of its own from the rest of the park. A tree-covered berm helps separate the area and make it visually more frontier-like. Cascade Peak with its majestic waterfalls was added. The stagecoach, which had a nasty top-heavy habit of tipping over with guests on board, and the covered wagons both closed forever in 1959. The new wilderness was now to be known as Nature's Wonderland, which premiered in 1960. The pack mule loading area was placed toward the front of Rainbow Ridge, the old black, green, and blue mine cars were repainted black, red, and yellow. With 1,700 feet of track, the ride was originally seven minutes long. But by the time of the expansion, there was 2,037 feet of track, making the ride through nature's wonderland a nine-minute journey. 200 animals were added to the attraction, due in part to advances being developed in animation technology. Another reason was Walt's desire to capitalize on the success of his four true life adventure films, The Living Desert, Beaver Valley, Bear Country, and The Olympic Elk. These new lifelike animal scenes were intended as Walt always intended everything in Disneyland to be, to inform, educate, and entertain his guests. The paint pots and old faithful geysers were added to the Living Desert section of the attraction, the jumping trout in the Bear Country section can still be seen on Big Thunder Trail to this day as an homage to the past. A variety of new environments had been created, from the mountains of Colorado, to the Arizona deserts, to the Wyoming backwoods. The sounds emanating from the buildings in Rainbow Ridge gradually would fade out as the trains pulled away heading into the wilderness, giving the sense of remoteness and isolation. From the Mark Twain or the Columbia, today's guests can view the last surviving mine car, which appears to have been struck by an avalanche and taken over by a family of restless marmots. Since there was stiff competition in the amusement business for parks to have more and more thrill rides, some further enhancements were considered throughout the early 1970s, including a simulated earthquake in the painted desert section of the attraction. When the mine train through nature's wonderland closed forever in 1977, Imagineer Tony Baxter's plan was to keep up with the competition, but still create Disney magic by developing more of a themed thrill ride involving a runaway mine train called Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Big Thunder opened in September of 1979 with a few subtle reminders of the mine train. The old dinosaur bones from the desert were now built into the rock wall for the splashdown at the end of the wild ride. Tony Baxter made sure that the original Rainbow Ridge buildings were stored at the Skyway Chalet in Fantasyland. They refurbished and then replaced them back on the hill where they once stood. Interestingly, in 1965, the mine train was an e-ticket attraction. A year later, it was reduced to a D where it stayed until 1972. For no apparent reason, it was then raised back to an e-ticket, where it stayed until 1976, when it was again dropped to D status. It disappeared forever in 1977.
Within a year and a day, Walt's $17 million dream to build a magical land of fantasy, imagination, history, and a look into the future was completed. It opened on July 17, 1955. A place of castles and rocket ships, stagecoaches and jungle cruises, Walt had achieved his dream of building a magic kingdom.